I want to talk to you today about how to live fearlessly with no fear of inadequacy, no fear of COVID-19. I don't know how big a deal that is for you today. It's still a big deal for us. No fear of feeling stupid, no fear of anything. How to live fearlessly. I think I told you before that I start my study on Sunday afternoon, oftentimes driving home. I'll have my wife read the next week's passage to me, and I read it out of the Bible. I think I read it, I had lunch with my in-laws this week, and anyway, it's a little downtime, and I read this passage, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I entered this verse into my scripture memory passage, these first four verses, and want to commit them to memory over the next uh, few weeks and months. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare. I had to look that up. A fowler is a guy who catches birds and his snare is his trap. So surely he'll save you from any trap that might come your way and from your deadly pestilence. I'll come back to that word in just a moment. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. And it reminds you of the words of Jesus where he said, How long, Israel, have I longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her little chicks? Um, anyway, his faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Uh, rampart sometimes translated buckler, and it's translated buckler because it's actually it's a big shield that's actually buckled to the the, the arm, so you, it, the shield won't won't get loosed. At any rate, you will not fear, and I highlighted that word right there. You will not fear because our topic is on on fear. We try to look at this passage through the lens of the assigned topic. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. And you see that word pestilence appeared two times. And I read this from this particular Bible app. This is the Olive Tree Bible app, because what I love about this Bible app is you can click on the word, and I clicked on the word pestilence down at the bottom, and you see the Hebrew word debar, and that means plague, pestilence, disease, a pandemic a pandemic. Sometimes people will say, you know, the Bible is just irrelevant to our days, and I'm not sure about your day. Maybe you were all over with the t- uh, pandemic, but we're still in the, in the midst of it, and uh, t- kids being taught at home, and, and so on. And so we want to look today about how, how to live fearlessly in the midst of a pandemic, how to live fearlessly in the midst of a pandemic. And if your pandemic, if the pandemic is solved by the time you, you watch this, well, you can just think about the next pandemic that, that might, might come along. I read a couple of books related to this and discovered, I didn't realize this, that the church has often thrived, has always thrived during pandemics, plagues, and famine. And the first one is an example, not of a pandemic, but a plague. But N.T. Wright talks about how the early church, uh, how they responded to, to a famine. So what did the Antioch Jesus followers say? They did not say either, this must be a sign, the Lord is coming back soon. When tragedy happens, you'll hear people say that sometimes, and the Lord might be coming back soon, but notice that that is not what the early church said. Or they did not say, this must mean that we have sinned, and we need to repent. We have sinned, and we need to get up every day and say, Father, I am a great sinner, and I have a great Savior, and uh, forgive me of, of my sins, and we have sinned. But the pandemic is not necessarily a sign that you have sinned, or even this will give us a greater opportunity to tell the wider world that everyone has sinned and needs to repent. And everyone has sinned and they do need to repent and we do need to tell the world. But this pandemic is not necessarily a sign of that. Nor do they start the blame game. Something that's dominating the news these days is these California fires, actually fires all over the West, but the California fires, uh, you can hardly see the sun. Maybe I'll throw up a picture here in a second of the, of the sun here in, in New Mexico, and you could hardly see the sun as, as it, it was setting because of all the smoke that, that, that is in the air. And politicians are doing the blame game, and one side is blaming one person or one, one issue, another side is blaming another issue, and we're not going to get into that. But the point is the church didn't get into the blame game, looking around at the civic authorities authorities in Syria or the wider region or even the Roman Empire to see whose ill treatment of the ecosystem or who's tampering with the food distribution networks might have contributed to this dangerous situation. No, they ask three questions and we do well to ask three questions when we face a pandemic. The first question is this, who is going to be at special risk when this happens? We know with reference to this pandemic, it's the elderly and it's the sick. And so we want to pay special attention to taking care of these vulnerable 
vulnerable, vulnerable populations. And then what can we do to help and who shall we send? If I were writing this book, I would have said it this way. What could we do to help and what are we going to do to help? What could we do to help and what are we going to do to help? And by the way, uh, a teacher, that's two questions you ought to ask every week. You ought to ask, what is the application? What could we do? What? Let's brainstorm a million things that we could do. And then I want you to think of one thing that you're going to do before the sun sets today. Because if I can get you doing something, do actually doing something, uh, your teaching will become un. an example. The second century, however, brought two massive plagues, pandemics we might call them, that killed millions across the Roman Empire. Christianity exploded after the first plague and again after the second. How'd this happen? Rodney Stark explains Christian values of love and charity from the beginning. They had gotten into the culture. They had gotten into, into the habit. From the beginning, the, the uh, values of, of love and charity from the beginning had been translated into the norms of social service in community solidarity. When disaster struck then, the Christians just did what they were in the habit of doing. They were better able to cope, and the result is a substantially higher rates of survival. This meant that in each aftermath of the ep epidemic, Christians made a larger and larger percentage of the population, even without new converts because everybody else was dying off. Examining the historical records of the day, Stark also found that when the plagues hit, almost everyone abandoned the cities. You think about this kind of a picture of, uh, we see a picture of this kind of thing in 9-11 where everybody else ran from, from the, the uh, falling buildings, uh, but the first responders ran toward the, the falling buildings. And he's saying here that Christians acted in a similar way. Almost everyone abandoned the cities, fled into the hills, sealed off the borders so that no one could come in except the Christians. They stayed and they cared for the sick and they cared for the dying. And doesn't that remind you of the historic love of Christ? And the result was, was, was that the church thrived. All right, let's skip forward to over 1300 years. and we look at Martin Luther's era. With God's permission, the enemy has sent poison and deadly dung, pestilence, uh, a pandemic, we might say, among us. And it happened oftentimes in, in history before kind of the modern era. And so I will pray to God. The first thing I will do is pray to God that he would be gracious and preserve us. Then I will pray to God and then I will do something else. I will fumigate. I will purify. I will sanitize. I will fumigate to purify the air. Give and take medicine. Avoid places and persons where I am in uh, not needed. How would we put that today? Avoid persons and places where I'm not needed. We might say we would. So Luther is saying I'll social distance. The first original social distance are right here. I'll avoid places and persons where I'm not needed in order that I may not abuse myself and that through me others may not be infected and inflamed with the result that I become the cause of their death through my negligence. If God wishes to take me, he will be able to find me. What's Martin Luther's mood right there? What does he feel? What's his response to fear? How much fear does he feel? Well, not at all. He says, if God wants to take me, I'm ready to go. I've looked at what is the worst possible thing that can happen, and I've accepted it. And uh, and, and then I work uh, toward avoiding that worst possible thing. If God wishes to take me, he is able to find me. At least I have done what he gave me to do and am responsible neither for my own death. I'm not reckless, my own death, nor the death of others. But if my neighbors need me, Am I going to stay away, social distance because I'm, I'm paranoid? No. If my neighbors need me, I shall avoid neither person nor place, but be, feel free to visit and help me. And that's a big idea we want, to, we want to talk about, that we want to avoid fear in a pandemic, and we want to pray to our God, as Nehemiah said it, and post a guard, do what we can do, avoid places and people where we're, where we're not needed, fumigate, sanitize the places as best we can, and then we're going to go about our life. And if we are needed somewhere, we will go. And the result of this is the church thrives. So we want to look then about how to live fearlessly in a, pan, a ta pandemic. If you'd like to read more on this, I recommend Max Lucado's book, uh, Fearless. Uh, and you might t take a look at this. Well, I'm running out of time here, so let me just say in passing that I did a little review at this point. Uh, the key to making your teaching unforgettable is to do some review, and I did some review of, of the overall theme, that it's not just about us uh, thinking right and behaving right. God also wants us to, to feel right. You could look at those slides, and you could go through the, the, that review. I think you've seen uh, how, how we dealt with that in the past, but let's dive into this week's text. 
And this is the place where I want us to focus our attention. Verses 5 and 6. You will not fear the terror of night. We want to talk about fear, and this verse talks about fear. So we want to focus on that verse. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies during the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. And here's observation number one. The observation number one is the promise is that you won't fear trouble. It is not that you won't have trouble. Look at this verse again. You will not fear the terror of the night. Is the terror of the night going to come? Yes. Nor will you fear the arrow that flies by day. Will the arrow that flies by day come? Yes. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Is the pestilence, is the pandemic going to come? Yes. But you won't fear these things. Good cross references, Daniel 3, 17 and 18, one of my favorite uh, passages. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able. Is God able to deliver us? Yes, God is able to deliver us from us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand, we think, <laughs> essentially what they're say, saying there. But even if he does not, we may not have read the situation correctly. And if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. I've got a quote from a section in, in Hebrews, and again, I'm not going to read the whole, whole passage, but just want to point out that, that, he, that he, he says of people of faith that time after time after time, God has delivered them. And then there's kind of a turning in this passage where he says, verse 35, women receive back their dead. Amen. Raised to life again. Amen. There were others who were tortured refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. And if you follow God in this world, there will be trouble. And our promise is not that bad things won't happen. It's that God will give you the ability to not fear when bad things do happen. Hebrews eleven thirteen. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. The promise is that you won't fear and trouble. It is not that you won't have trouble. Observation number two, the promise is not given to everyone. The promise is given to those who rest in God. Going back to verse one and two, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my, my God in whom I trust. This idea of resting or dwelling reminded me of John 15, and I would encourage you, I've got it in the PowerPoint, I encourage you to read through that passage and ask the question, what do we learn about abiding in Christ, about resting in God, about dwelling in, in, in God from that passage? But let's move Move along. Observation number one, the promise is that you won't fear. It's not that you won't have trouble. Observation number two, the promise is not given to everyone. It's given to those who abide in Christ, who rest in God. And observation number three is the promise is not a license to get stupid. Jesus says, do not put God to the test. I love that saying that goes, the Bible is a great commentary on the Bible. And Jesus' words particularly are a great commentary on the Bible. And Jesus actually quoted this passage here. And let's look at that, Matthew 5, 4, 5 through 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And I've got a picture of where we think this is. It might be the highest point of the temple itself, probably the highest point of the temple grounds. Down this corner of this temple, you could actually go there today. And you can see it's a uh, a pretty good distance up up there. And Jesus is standing there with the devil. And the devil says, just dump, jump down. It's going to be uh, uh, fun. You can hang glide without the hang glider. And the devil took him to the highest point uh, of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you. And he will lift up your hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone, a, a paraphrase of today's uh, passage. But Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, James McDonald's paraphrases it by saying, don't act foolishly and expect God to bail you out. Don't act foolishly. Just because God will protect you in trouble, we don't want to bring trouble on ourselves. We don't want to act foolishly. Well, this raises one final question, and that is this. What if you've already acted foolishly? What if you've already acted foolishly? And the good news is 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. I didn't know this, but I was listening to Tony Robbins' book, Unleash the Power Within, and he actually says that he's a Christian. I didn't realize he was a Christian, but he claims to be a Christian in in there. At any rate, he's got a famous saying that goes, the past does not equal the uh, the future. And truth be told, whether or not Anthony Robbins is a a, a Christian, I believe this is a thoroughly Christian sentiment, that the past does not equal the future. And if you and your people have done something stupid, the past does not equal the future. And you can look forward to the idea that God will bring you into a, a 
better future as you trust in him. And may God richly bless you as you teach these truths to your people this week.